Good afternoon. Hello, my name is Jamie Quinzer, and I'm the Vice President of Marketing here at SEEK. Uh, welcome to Episode 5 of Real Think. Today, we'll be focused on entrepreneurial leadership in the unknown. Today, our CEO, Alvaro Rize, is joined by Mr. Joel Peterson. Mr. Peterson is the Chairman of JetBlue, investor and board member for numerous startups, the former CEO of Tremel Crow Company, and has been a professor at the Graduate School of Business at Stanford since 1992. His recent book, Entrepreneurial Leadership, is a comprehensive practical guide to the math mindset needed to become an entrepreneurial leadership. Without further ado, Alvaro, Mr. Peterson, I'll let you get things going. Thank you, Jamie. Thanks, Jamie. And, and thank you, Joel, for being here. I think what, uh, what Jamie did not mention there is that if you, if you go and you take a lot of months studying for a very tough exam and apply for Stanford and then mortgage your life to be able to pay for Stanford and get in, the first thing that people tell you the moment that you step on campus is just make sure that you get into Joel's class. <laughs> <laughs> and so my thought here was, okay, let's just hack Stanford and get, uh, besides all of the necessary things to go there, and let's just get Joel in with, uh, with our crowd. Well, you're so nice to say. It's fun to talk to crowds. It's fun to talk to people uh, who are students there, but I love talking with executives and people who are out in the real world uh, making things happen. Absolutely. And, and one of the cool things about uh, our audience here, about the Sync family, is almost everyone uh, that, that is a team leader or a broker and that runs a team of real estate is, um, is a self-made entrepreneur. Most of the people in the industry haven't had a formal training, but they've built amazing growing businesses and they've done it with courage perseverance bumping into walls and so when I was uh, the, the thought starter of all of this was when I got your your last book and we'll talk about it in, in a minute about entrepreneurial leadership I was like this is a tactical guide this is a roadmap of how, how to do these things and how to go through it in a very structured manner that that we can all go to and so my hope with with putting this together is trying to give a little bit of that and, and try to get a true insight of that into our whole crew here. Um, so I really agree with you about real estate agents, real estate brokers. These are amazingly entrepreneurial people who are self-made, who hustle, figure things out. Uh, they're adaptable, they're creative, they're amazing. Uh, so I've worked with a lot of brokers over the years and uh, really enjoyed it. I hope we'll get some stories from, from your times at Crow. I'm sure there is a lot to tell. So let, let me show, so, so I'm gonna share my screen for one second. Let's see if this works because, so, so I just put together, this is a very quick, um, are you seeing there? The, this is our, uh, the, the, the four steps in your book of the how-to guide to be a successful entrepreneur, entrepreneur leader. And, if I had three hours, I would like to go through all of these points one by one in a very systematic manner. Uh, but, but since I don't, um, I was thinking of where to jump in as I prepared for this. And I thought, again, knowing my crew and, uh, and where they would be the most interested, I wanted to focus a lot on the first section, on build trust. And because I think a lot in our industry, we read a lot of books about, yeah, how to, how to set up core values for our company, how to do this for our company, but we don't invest a lot in ourselves as leaders. And, and I feel that's a very different approach that you're proposing. So if you're okay with it, my thought is to really ask questions about the build trust side. And then if I have a little bit of time left, a few of the, how to guide that you have at the end of the things that that impact our guys the most sure Does that makes sense absolutely i'll go wherever you want wherever you take me <laughs> that's a dangerous statement so so let's see i'll stop sharing my my screen and i will try to leave a few minutes at the end for um for a little bit of your view of the real estate industry how is it going today i know that you're also of course a very uh, a very smart real estate investor that has been in the industry for a long time. So I will reserve five to 10 minutes at the end to get your views there. So with that, let me, let me jump into build trust. Um, 
And, and before we go into the steps, uh, I'll, I'll take a little bit of a contrarian view here and, and play devil's advocate because I feel whenever you say something worth saying, it's not obvious. So, so you start by telling us that building trust is critical uh, to, be, to be a leader, yeah? And that it's not just about earning the trust of your clients. I think we all agree that earning trust of clients is super important and of the market. But you also say you need to earn the trust of your employees. And so my question is, why is that the case? Because the truth is, if you're playing your employees, they should be earning your trust. But why is it important? Why do you really need your employees to trust you? Well, you're actually fiduciaries for them and they for you. And those of you in the real estate business know that basically your word is your bond. Uh, your own private brand depends on you do on you delivering on promises. And if you can't do that with your employees, you know, if you, if you, you abuse them during the year and then pay them a big bonus at the end of the year, you may keep them until times are bad. You may keep them for a while. You may keep them until another offer comes along, but they're not really uh, connected to you. If you really get connected in a high trust bond, there's a covenant between you. You are like climbers belayed on a cliff. You're holding each other's ropes. And you're getting to the top together. What happens is agreements are more innovative, they're more flexible, they're more durable, and uh, you survive difficult times. We're right in the middle of this COVID crisis right now, and I actually think trust is the most powerful operating system you can have during this kind of a thing. I've, I've done a couple of turnarounds in my life, and I've really found that, uh, particularly in times like these, you know, to have a covenant with your customers, with your employees, with your suppliers, with your investors, with your lenders. Those are the things that get you through tough times. And you can't build trust. Uh, you can't start to build trust when times are bad. You have to develop it kind of a conversation at a time, lay it down a molecule at a time. You can destroy it quickly, but you can't build it quickly. So it's what I call one way sticky. And I think it's really the, the operating system of a life well lived. And I think in the real estate business, um, it's really critical. That is absolutely true, and I do, and I do agree. In fact, a, a, a good story in, in Argentina, when um, when the unions want to strike, sometimes instead of really striking, they just work by the rule book, and so they're still doing their job, but they don't get your company going, and and that's where the difference between just doing what they're paid for and uh, and being able to pull for your company. But, but in, in your story or in, in your life, you've been in countless of, of examples. Um, where would you say that, that you saw that? What, what's your best example of that trust coming through in a way where it made worthwhile investment that you're asking about? Gosh, there have been so many examples. One that I think of off the top of my head is I, had a, I, w I used to do deals, equity deals, with a fellow uh, in New York who is a, a big time money manager. And uh, we cut a transaction and uh, hung up the phone. Uh, he sent the money in. And a couple of days later, he called me up and he said, you know what? I think you made a mistake. Uh, I don't think you meant to do it the following way. And I, and I had made a pretty good sized mistake in my calculations. Uh, as I recall, it was several hundred thousands of dollars. And uh, so he, he changed the deal. He, at his insistence, we changed the deal to fix it for me. And for the rest of my career, I probably did a hundred deals with this fellow. For the rest of my career, I was looking out for a way to pay him back. And I, and I did. I looked for ways that I could be of service to him. It was much more fun, you know, to be looking out for each other, to have this high trust bond with a fellow. And it was way faster. Deals were made faster. They were more flexible. And, uh, and we just had a good time together. So that's, that's one case. And, and, and so when you're thinking about it, um, because what I love in your book is you're very intentional about yourself. So not, usually we are intentional about how we build our companies, right? We, I think everyone watching here has done an exercise with their company to assess their company values, to assess the company mission. Um, but we rarely apply that same intentionality to ourselves. And and so your first step in your book talks about assessing your core values. And when we think core values, we usually think our company core values. 
Um, so, so how do you do that in an intentional manner that you build yourself to be a person to be trusted? Well, first of all, let me say that you are a brand. Uh, people who know you expect certain things of you. you know, a brand is a promise. So when they think of Alvaro, they say, well, he's honest, he's direct, he's ambitious, he's hardworking. Whatever the brand elements are, there, there are brand attributes that you've got. And fundamentally, you deliver on those promises every day. And uh, Tom Peters calls it me ink. You know, what is me ink? <laughs> And I think that's a good way to think about it, but because ultimately you've built this brand over time. And I think the best way to do it intentionally is to think about what are the brand attributes I would like to have, and then assess those against what you actually do have. Uh, and you'll find there's some gaps, and those gaps are where you uh, are not fully trusted. This, what, what I call the say-do gap, the gap between what you say and what you do is a place for mistrust to enter in. And I think you want to reduce all of those as close to zero as you can so that your brand is a powerful brand. We know powerful brands in the marketplace really sell in good times and bad. People will go to the powerful brands because they trust that product or service. The same is true of you. And I think particularly true with real estate agents and brokers. People go to folks they trust. This is a major transaction that they're involved in. It matters a lot, whether it's either commercial relating to their business or personal relating to homes or other properties. This is really important. And trust is the medium of exchange. And if you can build that up with a really powerful brand, you'll find that your business does well in good times and bad. And you'll be happier. <laughs> That's for sure. But how do you, how do you tactically do that? So you mentioned that say-do gap and the gap between what um, you want to be perceived and known for, for and what you are actually known uh, for. So how do, I, how do you identify that gap and how do you then try to close that gap? Well, I'll tell a couple of uh, personal stories there. Uh, my youngest daughter was uh, applying for school, for college, and the question was, what five words best describe you? <laughs> and we spent a couple of hours talking about whether she was determined or stubborn. Uh, uh, ambitious or self-centered. Uh, and, and we really kind of worked on those to really define what was it about her and, and the nuance made all the difference. And so figuring out what you would like your brand attri attributes to be and then comparing them against what you are. I found when I did this of myself that I was actually pretty self-centered. I was kind of the center of my universe and that was getting in the way of my ability to be an effective leader. So I developed mantras. You know, part of what I did was just say, I've got to have things that I repeat to myself. When I find myself violating the operating system I would like to have, I'm going to rewrite my operating system. So I developed three mantras and I said them to myself over and over for a number of years and until I no longer had the problem. I was really rewired. And I think a lot of people are, are happy with saying, well, the devil made me do it, or that's how I was raised, or I can't help it, that's how I feel. Those are excuses. In the end, we all own our operating system. You know the old saying that Abraham, Link that Abraham Lincoln uh, said that uh, every man by the time he's 40 has the face he deserves? I kind of uh, tweak that to say every person by the time they're 40 has the operating system they deserve. And they've either let it just grow out of peers and parents and DNA or whatever, and it's just how I am, or they've said, I want to be intentional about it. I want the, the Me Inc. brand to really be powerful and reliable. And by the way, it's not really just a trivial thing to do or a, an unimportant thing. What you find is if you develop that in a way that is completely predictable, you find that the people that are working for you are empowered. They can make decisions. They know that you're not gonna jump in and second guess them and they're not nervous about it because you're so predictable. They understand your brand so well that they're empowered to make decisions. So you're no longer making 70, 30 decisions. You're making 51, 49 decisions and other people are empowered. Your whole organization is empowered because you have this incredibly powerful, trustworthy brand. So it's worth going through the, the, uh, the words that you'd like to be associated with your brand. You talk there because I see a question pop up 
about what were those three mantras? So during your transformation, how, how did you, what was the gap that you identified and what were the mantras that you used to, to change that? Well, the gap about being self-centered, I basically uh, repeated to myself, it's not about me, it's about the mission. And that sounds like a simple thing, but your mantra has to be really simple. It has to just provoke in you something that will say, oh yeah, that's right, I, it's not about me. I'm not at the center of the universe. So I really kind of rooted that out of myself. The second one that I uh, had was, uh, I am not my emotions. So I used to, I used to uh, just react. <laughs> well, that's how I feel. So I would do or act how I felt. And I really realized, no, there's, there's something that I can decide. I don't have to respond to my emotions. I can think about it. I can get information. I can listen to other people. I am not my emotions. And the third one for me was, I was always... A little, what, so here's what I was trying to address. I would always kind of blame circumstances or blame other people. You know, if I ever failed to do something, there was a reason. I could always find an excuse. Uh, you know, if it was a book report that I was working with other people on, they didn't get their part done on time or well or something like that. But you can see it's a, it's a related problem to the first one. And so I, I developed this mantra that just said, I have all I need. And that calmed me down. And uh, so I wasn't, I, I wasn't pushing and driving and blaming and doing all that. I have all I need. So to me, it's not about me. It's about the mission. I'm not my emotions. And I have all I need. And those became really powerful mantras. They sound simple and kind of silly at this stage. But at an early stage in my career, when I was just developing my leadership brand, mm. uh, those became important. Um, so... I don't know if, if that's. Yeah, what I don't, I don't for, think uh, they're obvious. I think <laughs> uh, it's very normal for us to fall on immediately thinking what was out of our control yeah. and instead of focusing on, on we, what we could control. Now, one thing that, um, that I think you mentioned in the book, um, but you didn't say that when, when you apply those mantras, it is very easy to feel responsible for everything too. I think one of the things I admire about um, your way of leadership is that at the same time you cut yourself some slack in the sense of like, yeah, no, I have everything I need. I won't despair about what I don't, but, but um, not everything will always go my way and I'm okay with it. Right. Yeah, you can't blame yourself. And I actually think it's kind of unproductive to blame others and circumstances. Good and bad things happen. I would say a little bit of rain falls in every life. One of the things I learned being in the airline industry for 21 years was pilots say it's always sunny above the clouds. And that's so true. If you really think about it, you know, when you're, when you're in the fog or down in a city where it's cold and rainy or whatever, all you do is break through the clouds and it's sunny. And it's always sunny somewhere on earth. And so you imagine those kinds of things and it, it actually lifts your spirits. And you say, you know, there'll be another day, there'll be another opportunity. Um, I, I tell a story in the book about uh, Trammell Crow, who was kind of my mentor and hero and my first real boss in business. Uh, he saw me at my desk one time with my head in my hands, uh, lamenting that I'd lost a deal. I'd been working on a deal for two months and I worked really hard. And I thought I had it and it disappeared on me at the last minute. And so I was really depressed and kicking myself. And he came over and said, what's wrong, Joel? And he sat down and listened to me and I told the sad story and I thought I'd get a lot of sympathy. And he just <laughs> popped up and he said, there's a trolley every five minutes and walked back to his desk. You know? And it really helped me realize, hey, there is a trolley, there'll be another trolley. Uh, we don't have to lament things. Bad things are gonna happen to us, move on. That was great advice. One of my friends and clients uh, here in real estate once told me, I'm out of a job every time I close a deal and every right. time I lose a deal. <laughs> right, right. And, and so that, uh, I think that's what drives the hunger a lot of, of, of all the people that we have here in the real estate world, um, which is different than, than most industries. Here you hunt, you really hunt what you kill. And, and that does drive a little bit of, a, of desperation if you don't control it. And, and that's why part it of- desperation, but it also drives creativity and energy and it's one of the reasons uh, people in this business are so entrepreneurial they're so creative they're so clever they're so hard working is because there's a little bit of anxiety and fear 
in the back of that, but there should be a lot of optimism and courage and things to go along with it and cancel some of the anxiety out. There is. I'll tell you, and as my personal experience in this last month, I've never more been more inspired in my life than by my clients in the last month. Like living in the world where today where it seemed everyone was falling apart. I've talked with more than 60 clients in the last two, three weeks and the level of optimism, of energy, of course, everyone is scared and wondering what's happening and how, but the ability to overcome it and, and the willingness to go and fight it is, uh, it really shows me why this industry is what it is. And, and I absolutely agree with you that, that it does generate a very special kind of people. Yeah. But, but it also has the risk. So in your book, you talk a little bit about how to protect your personal life. And the question that I wanted to ask you there, because I've, again, a lot of people in our industry talk about different systems that you have to try to preserve some measure of balance between your personal life and your job. Because as you've mentioned, for many, many people in the real estate world, the brand is you and you are the brand. And it's, you don't leave it at the door of your office because you live through it in your weekends when you go to soccer matches. And, and so my question more to you, rather than, than focusing on how you protect time for your family, is how do you protect your family emotionally? When your best, when your own brand, reputation, and economic survival depends on the very business that, that you're running, how, how do you leave that at the door when you come home? Not just being able to be home at, some, at, at a reasonable time, but how do you leave behind all of that that is part of your life? Yeah, that's a real challenge. Uh, but, but I do think if you imagine that your life is really about these relationships, this family, I, you know, I was talking uh, so, with uh, somebody the other day and I said, you know, we're not raising scholars or athletes or whatever, we're, we're raising great human beings. And so it's just a, a slightly different twist on it. And I find the, the power of borders uh, is really incredible. So I've always set some boundaries uh, and some borders between things that I just won't cross. them. I remember uh, going back to Trammell Crow, I remember him calling me. I was only a couple of weeks out of business school and he called me at my home on a Sunday afternoon and said, I need your help. Uh, could you come down to the office and help me on a deal? And I remember being flattered after all his name was on the door and I was just right out of business school. And uh, I thought for a second, I said, Trammell, I'm so sorry, but I've reserved Sunday afternoons for my family. I'll be down as early as you want and stay as late as you want uh, tomorrow morning. And I ended up as the managing partner of the company. So it didn't hurt me. And, I, and so I've, I've thought about this idea of what boundaries am I going to set? What am I going to do to protect that space in my life? And the reason you need it is because you need a safe place. You need to be able to recreate. Recreation comes from this idea of recreating. And I think people who are under pressure, like people in the real estate business, need a way to recreate. And it's with these special relationships that are lifelong with family and friends and whatever. And so they have to protect those. And I think setting the boundaries. So one of the things that I did a long, long time ago is I said, I'm going to write an email every weekend to all of my children. And uh, that's just sacrosanct. I don't have to think about it anymore. I just, you have many I just of those. wake up and do it. How many children do you have, Joel? <laughs> for... Yeah, I've got a tribe. I've got seven kids. <laughs> so, so there's two hours of your day there. <laughs> no, I actually write them the same email. <laughs> <laughs> At Sync, we have great mass email capabilities. <laughs> if, you need, right. Right. if you need a platform to support you, Joel, we're here. <laughs> um, but, but putting your, your, your investor hat for a second, and so think about all of these teams of people led by these very unique individuals, and you've talked about building that trust. How do you, from outside, identify whether you're facing someone that has done what you're saying, that has invested in their own brand and personality and rewired themselves to, to be able to be someone that you can trust, uh, versus someone that might be running a great business because there are untrustworthy people that run successful businesses at least for a while. How do you identify between one and the other and, and guide your, your investments accordingly? So I'd say a couple of things about that. One is you're not always going to get it right. 
you are you are solving for trust you're trying to figure that out but you can be fooled and so don't kill yourself don't beat yourself up if you get fooled by somebody there's some very clever people out there <laughs> who are good at marketing and can convince you of something that isn't so that said i think if you do in-depth interviews and you ask about their decision making at points of change in their life why did they do this why did they stop doing one thing and start doing another how did they solve a problem what was their thought process then i think doing due diligence talking with not only the references that they give you but second and third order reference checking uh, helps and then i think you have to realize that trust and being sure about it develops a conversation at a time a promise delivered at a time so when you work shoulder to shoulder to somebody if they keep delivering on promises you're going to trust them more and more and uh, as that trust account grows you give them bigger decisions they take on more and trust grow. You, you you just can't expect somebody to come in on the first day trust them profoundly uh, if you do you you are exposing yourself to betrayal and if you never trust you and if you do trust you will occasionally be betrayed and there are ways to repair that or to deal with betrayal. And that's one of the things that I talked about in the, in the book is how do you deal with betrayal? Because it is a risk of trust. Yeah, and, and I think we've all, we've all made those mistakes. Yep. And, and I think it is important, impossible to avoid. But as I, as I wrap up this part, uh, I think what I take away from, from what I've read and what you've told, um, I think the idea of stopping and actually saying, what do I want to be known for and being honest about, okay, so now let's step outside of myself and trying to find out what I am really uh, known for. And then the concept that, that I can change something about myself and that I can um, make a, a specific effort. I, I remember actually in, in your class, I had a, uh, a friend of mine who, who was in the IDF in the Israeli Defense Force and he made me do an exercise that I found extremely hard at the time. He said, try not lying for three days in a row. And I'm like, well, I don't lie. Oh, yes, you lie. You lie constantly. Try actually not lying. If you say I'm going to send you an email in five seconds, you're lying already because you're not going to send it in five seconds. Take what you say literally and see if you can stick to it. And I did it. And it was extremely hard. And I still today, I don't do it well because I am absent minded and and then he gave me one even more difficult. He said, now, after I did it for three days, he said, try not lying to yourself for three days. Yeah. Whatever you tell yourself, just make sure you do it for three days. And, and it was the hardest thing I did in my life. We lie to ourselves all the time because it's yeah. of wishful thinking and because uh, we believe approximation is enough. And so I, I find it very, very... Um, specific and, and, and valuable to me that you say, you know what, it is in your power. You don't have an excuse. Sit down, find the gap between what you want to be and what you are, and put yourself a specific exercise to achieve that. And mm -hmm. then when you fail, don't beat yourself up. Figure out how to be successful going forward and uh, accept feedback. Look for feedback. Feedback is the breakfast of champions. If you can get <laughs> people to tell you what you didn't do well, thank them for it and then let them know what you're gonna to do to correct it and then be accountable for it. And you can be on this constant improval, improvement uh, program and, and it actually gets to be fun. Uh, I used to, I remember after certain sales meetings in real estate, I'd pull the team aside and say, what did we do well? And what did we not do so well? And I would start out by saying, you know what? I think I continued to try to sell after the sale was made. Mm -hmm. I need to stop doing that. And people would kind of nod and say, yeah, you're right. And uh, I would thank him for it. And then everybody kind of pitched in and said, well, you know what I think I could have done better was, and pretty soon it became fun to give feedback exercises. We're, we're all getting better together. And uh, that's a fun thing to do. Oh, I fully agree. I think, uh, and it can be tough at the beginning, but it gets less tough as you do more of it, right? For sure, you get better at it. And so I'm, I'm gonna skip, uh, a little bit over so again if, if we go back to 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 your your steps um let me put it back up for a second um share screen so so i think 
of course, creating a mission is extremely important. I really recommend people. And by the way, on the book, we're gonna, whoever comments after the fact on this video, we're gonna raffle 10 of, of, of the Entrepreneurial Leadership book. I sincerely recommend everyone reading it. Um, I think the create a mission, you, I agree with full heart and everything there, but it is something that we, a lot of us have seen and it's, it's we know that we have to do it. <laughs> and you have a great blum up of how to do it, but at least we know, we know that. Um, and, and on the, um, and so, and so I do want to step at least a second on the hiring and firing, because you talk about firing with empathy, which is something that doesn't necessarily come natural. And, and so if you could say just two things, one thing on, on hiring, what is the most important or different thing that you've learned that is not what you would have thought it was going to be about hiring and and another thing about firing that, that you would not have naturally thought was uh, what needed to be done. Sure. Can I say something about mission first, though? You, you kind of glossed over that quickly. And I, it's yours. Well I, people, I, well, I think people get a little bit um, used to hearing about mission and mission statements and everything. I find that most mission statements create cynicism. They get framed and put on the wall and people say, well, people aren't really living that. Or we really don't believe that. To me, missions are all around meaning and meaning is all around what people really care about. And I think that means getting the team to, to wordsmith what it is that we're about. You know, there's a fellow, a playwright by the name of Tom Stoppard that said, words are sacred. If you choose the right ones and put them in the right order, you can nudge the world a little bit. And I think getting a mission statement that nudges the world a little bit, where people say, you know, I'm here for this reason. You don't have to motivate them at that point in time. They're all about that. So I think once you have a built a high trust, high trust culture, developed a mission that really belongs to folks that is around the set goals that are memorable, actionable, aligned, and doable. And then you can move on to saying, I need to now make sure that I've got the best team on the field at all times and that starts so now uh, if i could go back to your hiring question that starts with hiring people well hiring great people i think starts with sourcing great people you know if you never see the great people out there you'll never be hi you're hiring from a menu that doesn't have a meal on it that you want to eat <laughs> so i think sourcing is really critical and i think a lot of times people source from friends and uh, it's what i call the hire me syndrome they hire themselves over and over and over again. Please no. I think really looking outside of your own world and thinking about people with different perspectives. You want them to have the same values, but you really want them to have a different optic. You know, the navigators talk about triangulating, and that's how they get a sense on where something is. Well, if you have people with diverse points of view, different optics, you get a more complete view. And so sourcing is really important. Then I think the onboarding process is the second one that really surprises me, is that you really have to be thoughtful about how you onboard people. I've found that many times giving somebody a project to do before I hire them is really a great way to be, for them to be sure and for me to be sure. If it isn't a good decision for them, it's not a good one for me. And so What's a good example of that? What's that? What's a good example of that? Because it sounds a little uh, strange to give some, someone something to do before, before they actually get hired. Yeah, well, we've done it a number of times here at Peterson Partners where we've said, we've got a project, we want to redesign our website, or we'd like to get all of our portfolio companies a communication. Why don't you help us put that together? And by rubbing shoulders with somebody for a couple of weeks, it's only a, it's a project, we obviously pay them for it, uh, but it becomes a way of doing things. They like it, we like it, they're more certain when they join, we're more certain when they join. And, uh, and the odds of hiring the right people go way, way up. So I think that's important. But your next question had to do with, with firing. And to me, firing uh, is really a vital part. You know, my mom used to say, uh, Joel, somebody needs to clean the toilets. You know? <laughs> so uh, you need to understand that there are things that have to be. So it's not ever a pleasant thing to do, but it's absolutely necessary if you want to keep the best team on the field. If you don't, you'll build up dead wood in an organization and that's not fair to the people who are really working hard and productive but it was also your mistake and i think that's a really important mindset to have is it's not the per you brought them on you worked with them you coached them you promoted them you gave them assignments they maybe maybe weren't clear 
or whatever. And uh, so you have to take responsibility. So my view is do it with empathy, do it with grace, be generous, help them move on in their lives to another place. They'll be alumni. They'll speak forever of you, either in hallowed terms or aggressive ones. So, uh, you know, building the team and unbundling the team and moving on is a really important skill to develop as an entrepreneurial leader. And, and how do you accomplish that when you say with empathy? What's the difference between firing the right way and the wrong way that you could put your finger on? Well, I think one of the things is if it's a surprise. Uh, I made that mistake a couple of times when I've surprised somebody. I don't think that's really fair to a person. I think you should pull them aside and say, may I give you some feedback? May I give you some coaching? People will always say yes. They'll always allow you to do it, but it shows a level of respect for them. And then you give them the feedback and eventually you say, you know, I need you to work on two things. You can't give them everything. You can't say everything you do is bad and wrong. You have to say specifically, here are the two things that I'd like you to work on. Let's report in, let's talk about it. And at some point in time say, you know, things aren't really going as they should. And by the way, this can take place over a matter of a few weeks uh, and certainly a few months. And usually by then people say, you know what? I think I should probably get my resume together and they are often ready to move on. They, they've read the tea leaves, they understand. In other cases, if they haven't, then I think you go and you say, I've decided that I need to make a change. I want to talk to you about the best way to move you on. Let's talk about the announcement. Let's talk about severance. Let's talk about uh, uh, COBRA. Let's talk about all the things that help you to get onto a better place in your life. Um, so it's it's never pleasant, and it shouldn't be something you look forward to. But it's something; it's part of the job, and you have to get good at it. And I do think, in many cases, it ends up being the right thing for both. Uh, it is; it's absolutely the right thing for both. Nobody wants to be someplace where everybody's thinking they should be fired. Yeah, I've actually been fired, and it was the best thing that ever happened to me. So I'm, you know, I I, I don't hesitate to to think about these discussions. I think they're important. And, and what I think is, is important to highlight, especially with someone with your tenure in both small and big companies is because a lot of very successful leaders preach hire slow, fire fast. And like, if you're having doubts, you already should have fired them, right? I, I don't think the, what you're describing doesn't, doesn't coincide with that. And it's more of like, no, if yes, don't, don't, you cannot ignore the fact that someone is not working, but just firing before giving yourself time to make sure it's also not the right choice. Yeah, I don't think I disagree with that notion, though. I think in most cases, people uh, hire too fast and they fire too slowly. So I, I really think that's the right instinct and people should have that say, you know, uh, I want to be careful, bring somebody on in a really thoughtful way. But many cases, you know, pretty soon <laughs> that somebody isn't working out right. I used to tell a fellow that I worked with uh, that uh, if somebody sticks their nose in their in your door and you say, oh, I wish they'd go away. That is an early indicator that maybe things you need to be starting on the path to let them go. Whereas if you say, oh my gosh, come on in, sit down and tell me what you're working on. That's an indicator that you can really build on that person. So often our hearts know things that our brain hasn't yet processed. We should pay attention to that and move more quickly uh, and do it thoughtfully. It's nicer to both parties. I love it. And so as, as we move along, I think when you go, you have a lot of very tactical points on deliver results. And by, by the way, some people were asking if we were going to share uh, that slide that I show. Can, do I have, can, I, can I share that after the fact, just the, the index? Uh, I, I really think people should go in and, and get the details. But so um, it, out of all of the how-tos, I was thinking which ones uh, applied uh, the best to our team or would be the least obvious to our team. And I, I thought about when you talk about how to use a board effectively, because most real estate teams, I don't need to have a board. So I don't have a board unless I ask for a board. And the question is, should I ask for a board or it's my company and I should do whatever I want with it? Well, so there are different kinds of boards. There are boards of advisors, which really can be kind of helpful to just nudge you and give coaching and be available to you. They're often made, of, made up of mentors or friends friends or folks that you've had a prior relationship with, they don't really have any legal control. 
uh, typically a board of directors reports to shareholders. And so that's separate and they do have legal control. Individual board members are not powerful. Boards are very powerful. Boards can make or break your company. <laughs> so you have to decide whether or not you want to cede that kind of control to somebody. You can typically get stronger, more complete leaders uh, if you actually formally organize a board. But I think you have to be careful about it. It takes time to manage a board. It takes a lot of thought. But on the other hand, uh, you know, a lot of times when you prepare for that, you actually think through issues more clearly. I don't know if you've ever had the experience that I have of when I think I've got a question, I'll prepare the question. And I'll think about the question. And by the time I've really carefully prepared the question, I know the answer. You know, <laughs> Whereas if I don't formulate it really well, I, I remain kind of anxious by this, this unspoken uh, worry that I've got. Whereas if I'll actually formulate it, so boards can help with that too. So I think there are arguments, pro and con, advisor versus official board of directors, there are pros and cons as well. And I, I think the, the one thing you mentioned for me in the book is, is accountability. And, and even if your board does not control your company, if you truly just set a group of advisors to which you don't feel accountable in any way, their advice usually is not that strong, right? right. Um, but there is an intermediate point where this is my company, I don't need to have a board that defines my actions but I do have someone, a coach or an advisor that I give some sort of power of accountability over me so that I need to have that, those thoughts that you're saying as I'm preparing even to go and, and have that meeting, right? Well, I think it's one of the most important conclusions people make in life uh, or don't, you know, that I am either accountable for my life uh, and there'll be kind of an end reckoning to family, friends, higher power, whatever, or I'm not accountable and I can kind of do whatever I want and it doesn't matter. That's a really important fork in the road for most people. Agreed, agreed. Um, and so I would have a thousand more questions on the how to, but I know that we're 40 minutes in and, and I really don't want to not have a little bit of your views on the real estate world. So if we, forget for a second about um, just running the companies itself and we think, okay, let's think about the market. What's happening now? What do we think is gonna happen? What would you tell us are your views? Well, let me issue a caveat here first. Uh, and that is that for 20 years, I was really involved uh, really all over the world, but in 92 cities in the United States, we had a $14 billion portfolio we were the largest private developer in the world, and I knew uh, lots and lots of markets. I do remember one day somebody asking me about the LA market, what was going on in the LA market. So I called my partners out there and they said, Joel, what do you mean? There are 123 LA markets. Some are overbuilt, some are underbuilt, some product types are going well, others are doing poorly. So I think it's, I learned in that role that it's dangerous to talk about the market. Real estate is very fragmented uh, and is very different. And it depends on uh, job growth, population growth, a whole bunch of things that are different market to market. And so they're competitive forces that you have to look at. So that's one caveat. Then I would say that I spent the next 18 years out of real estate. I didn't do anything in real estate. I started buying companies and teaching at Stanford and whatever. So I lost track of the real estate world largely. Um, and then I was flying down to Trammell Crow's funeral uh, in, I think, 07 or 08, something like that. It was about the time of the financial crisis. And uh, my chief financial officer was on the plane with me. And I turned to him and I said, Bob, have you ever thought about getting back into real estate? And he said, I was about to say the same thing to you. <laughs> and uh, so we've said, what if we formed a fund? So we've now formed uh, three funds we do what we call co-GP investing. What that means is that we put capital with developers that we know that are great entrepreneurs, great business people, and we go out and uh, invest primarily in multifamily, which by the way, in our experience, is still doing very well, still very well leased, very well taken care of. Um, and then hotels, which by the way, are doing terribly. Uh, I, had a, I had one of our hotel partners say, I never thought I'd be so excited to see our occupancy at 30%. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, product types do different different ways. But I think real estate is a capital intensive business. You need to make sure that you've got cushions. 
You need to over equitize uh, real estate. You need to be thoughtful about what direction a market is going in. And I think you have to look forward longer than you do in many businesses because it takes longer to build these uh, products and so markets can take longer. The final thing I'd say is that uh, uh, at a personal level, we've seen a lot of activity in the single family. Now, even in the midst of this, we've seen houses close and things happen. So um, that's kind of surprising, that's counterintuitive. But most of my successful business decisions uh, in life have been uh, swimming upstream, going against the grain, doing what everybody says, oh, that won't work. Um, so I, I'm, I'm bullish. I remain investing in real estate. I remember doing, I, I remain doing a lot of things in real estate. Do you, do you think as for the second half of this year, um, of course, things will get better than they are now, but do you think that the level of activity will be comparable to last year above or below, or do you not have really an opinion on that? I'm smart enough not to make a prediction, but I will say that, uh, you know, with interest rates where they are, that really means that affordability is fundamentally different from what it has been in higher interest rate markets. So I think there are countervailing forces that I would not, even though I think there's some fundamentals, you know, which I mentioned that job growth and population are the two huge drivers. And I think jobs are going to be a little bit difficult and dicey. Uh, I, I spoke with the uh, former chairman of the President's Council of Economic Advisors, and he said he thought our recovery was going to be a check mark. And what he meant by that is it could be a rapid decline and then a slow, steady build over time. And uh, that makes the most sense. I've looked at the, the W, the L, the U, <laughs> and the V, and, and I think the check mark is Probably my best guess best for that, well. but I, I, I'm not, not in the prediction business. Well, I'm, I'm not as wise as you. And, and so at the end of March, when, when the world seemed to be falling apart, I predicted, uh, I think this year, the total number of homes sold will not drop more than 10 or 15% versus last year. Um, just the, my theory is that it's so inelastic, the, 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 the fact of buying or Selling a home is not something that you can put off for six months if you need it. You're getting married or divorced or having kids or, or your kids are leaving. It's not something that you can say, eh, let's wait for a year before we get divorced, right? Yeah. Especially if you've been quarantined for two months together. Right, right, right. <laughs> but uh, but no, that's, that's, that's great. And so in general, if we pull out of, of, uh, of real estate, and you think about the U.S. economy uh, as as the world goes forward. Um, are, are you do you have the same sense of check mark of yes slow recovery after the the, the strong uh, fall, or or do you think it's it's going to behave differently? Well, I think that's the general bet. Uh, there are some things. For example, we have some businesses that are uh, in the fulfillment arena. You know, people are buying more online, and they're booming. Uh, there are certain things, uh, you know, homeschooling or, uh, you know, a lot of these Zoom products. I have a friend that would, was an early investor in Zoom and he can't believe what's happening there. So there are areas that are going to do quite well and grow and bounce back fast. There are others. So I've, I've been in the airline business for a while and I think it's going to take a while. Mm -hmm. One of the things we did that's consistent with this book is we said, what again, what are the attributes we want for our brand? And the first one is safety. And the safety, so air flying uh, has been the safest form of travel forever. And now we have to add this new layer that says health safety. So for people to really pick up and travel again, they're going to have to feel that it's safe. That means the air is safe, the distances are safe, people aren't allowed on with fevers, et cetera. And that, That'll just take some new, uh, some new models, some new ways of thinking about it. You know, when 9-11 happened, uh, it took eight or nine months for the traveling public to say, wait a minute, we can get on planes again. <laughs> it's, but it's going to be different for each industry. Yeah, I agree. And so now I'm going to open it up a little bit for questions for the few minutes we have left. And I have the first one there, which is, what are your favorite resources for or real estate or other to understand trends, markets, what market statistics. Is there any book, newsletter, or blog that you recommend? You know, 
I don't. I rely on my partners who are in that on a daily basis. So I, just so you know, I'm in the, I'm in at least a dozen industries now and uh, I'm teaching uh, three different courses, five, four different classes at Stanford. So I don't stay on top of the details the way that I used to and the way that you need to in order to be effective. So I, I, I just, but I do have great part. The thing that I find that I do at this age and stage, today's my birthday. I, I just turned 73 years old. Happy <laughs> birthday. <And, laughs> <laughs> at that age, what you do, yeah, what you do at that age is you make sure that you're in business with really great people that you like and trust and who can stay on top of all of that stuff. So I listen to them and um, it's worked out pretty well. It has indeed. And so I have another question for you. Uh, and so as you talked about trust and, um, and hiring and firing team players, what would you say when someone, when you hire someone and you see that they are more interested on um, expanding in the land grab and expanding their own influence than in actually doing the job that you've hired them for? Well, I think you have to confront it immediately. My view is you don't let grass grow under your feet on stuff like that. You, you talk with them about it and say, you know, I've got some concerns. One of them is the following and you give specifics. And you say, is this going to become a problem? Is this something that we should talk some more about? Uh, the thing to say, I don't trust you or you're not giving your all to me. People don't know what that means. Whereas if you say, you know, I know that you've got uh, uh, escrow accounts uh, set up on pet purchases of land or that you're helping on this kind of thing. I'm curious about that. What's your overall plan? I'm a little concerned that that doesn't fit. And, and you have a specific conversation. And just never fear the specifics. And uh, I think that's the way to address it. I have a friend who's an entrepreneur who says uh, that she's really patient with uh, people. And she says, I love you, I love you, I love you, get out of here. <laughs> you know? She puts up with it until she's angry. Well, that's not the way, and she knows that it's not the way to do it. But uh, I find being authentic, specific, direct is much nicer and friendlier than brushing it under the rug and worrying about it and then finally exploding. <laughs> yeah, I agree. <laughs> exploding is never good. <laughs> no, it's not a good plan. I have a quick one. What book are you reading now? So I'm just finishing up uh, one called The Second World Wars by Victor Davis Hanson, uh, but it's on the heels of reading three Churchill biographies, <laughs> Walking with Destiny, uh, The Churchill Factor, and... Um, the oh it's the one by uh the vile the splendid in the vile or the vile the splendid in the vile which, which one would you would you recommend the most out of the three you know i uh if you're a real churchill fanatic walking with destiny gives you it's 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 this thick you know i mean it's really <laughs> the big thick you know complete book it's wonderful wonderfully written by andrew roberts who's a great historian. The Churchill Factor was written by Boris Johnson, who's the current prime minister. And he was a journalist before that. And so his mm -hmm. style is very journalistic, but he's, he's very much in love with Churchill. So if you don't like Churchill, if you're not kind of wild about him, you may not like the book. I'm a big fan of Churchill's, even understanding all of his flaws. It's actually one of the reasons I like him. It's because he's got these flaws that he's worked around. Uh, but it, it, and I'll also add the most important thing that I picked up from reading these three back to back to back was Churchill saying that uh, the worst things that happened to him in his life turned out to have been the best things. Mm -hmm. And many of the best things turned out to have been the worst. So we don't really have perspective until you get a little bit older. In other words, he said his years in the wilderness before World War II was what prepared him to lead the world out of World War II. So a lot of times... We wouldn't be prepared if we didn't go through these hard times. And talk about someone that lived to, to your concepts of having their own brand and having their own core values. And more than anything, being predictable, being predictable in the good and in the bad. Yes. If yeah. I tell you I'm going to do something, you know, I'm going to do it. But whatever counts, uh, yeah. makes absolutely, absolute sense that, that he would be a character that you, that you follow and admire. Joel, I would ask 
a hundred more questions, but but I know I've I've run out of time, and I don't want to uh, hold you for more time than I should. Especially now that I've learned that it's your birthday, I'm feeling very <laughs> bad. Please apologize for me to your family. Uh, I, I appreciate immensely the fact that that you took this time with us. I, I think it's extremely valuable and. Is that thank you thank you so much for joining us today well thank you and thank all of the your participants too it's so nice of them to come on and spend some of their time with me so i appreciate that well with that everyone thank you so much for joining us uh yes we will um we will be um we have recorded the session and we will um put it in our youtube channel if you look for the sync youtube channel there's the real sync uh, episodes and you'll find this one again i encourage leave us a comment we will be ruffling um, um, many of the of joel's books and i think they're the bomb so <laughs> so get in and get one of them and as always thank you thank you so much for joining us and we'll see you the next time great thanks alvaro thank you joel